This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review and exciting times. You know, I don't get to say that all that often, but we have the Snapdragon X Plus and Elite Processors for Windows Machines. So Windows on ARM, ARM on Windows, you know, you get the idea there. But uh, in the past, they those processors had been too slow. So Microsoft had been playing with them on previous products, but it was hard to really recommend them, as gorgeous as the hardware might have been. That's all changed now with Surface Pro 11. Comes in lovely colors like this sapphire blue. As always, they have some nice colors. Dune, platinum, and black are the others this time. But the performance is finally here, and the battery efficiency. We're going to look at it now. All right, so the Surface Pro basic form factor hasn't changed, and you get the anodized aluminum exterior Gorilla Glass 5 on the display. The Surface Kinect for the charger. You can also charge via USB-C, two USB-C ports, and that's about it for hardware physical connectivity, other than the connector that you use to connect the keyboards magnetically to the bottom. There's also a new keyboard option we're going to talk about as well. So... Finally, this thing is just snappy to use. So we're, we're, as the old Surface Pro X was <laughs> torturous at times, even in running Windows, which is natively compiled for ARM, so there's, there's no emulation delay or anything like that, right? That was a, a slow dog. This is feels zippier, more responsive than even the current AMD and Intel x86 offerings that you can buy today. Huzzah! And now a shout out to our sponsor, Trend Micro Premium Security Suite. That's their most comprehensive package, and it gives you a complete device and identity protection across 10 devices. What does that mean? Macs, PCs, iOS, Android. So one subscription covers 10 devices, all your operating systems. And these days, you know, even with the new Snapdragon processors for Windows laptops, you still need antivirus protection, by the way. It, it really matters about the operating system more so than the processor, so keep that in mind. And nowadays, it's summer coming up, and you might travel, or you travel for work like I do, going to different events and product rollouts and stuff, and their VPN protection is awesome. Protects you on Wi-Fi networks, encrypts data traffic, keeps you safe so you can do what you need to do without any of your packets being stolen. Packets of data, that is. And of course, it is lightweight antivirus protection. There are child safe monitors so you can block unsafe websites. And there's dark web monitoring and a password manager as well. Be sure to check out our link below and in the description to save. And now back to our video. All right, so performance perceived performance is good. Benchmark performance is also good for native applications, like Geekbench 6 is native on ARM, for example, Cinebench 2024, and uh, most benchmarks that are x86 only don't, they refuse to run on ARM, so it's not like I'm holding back and giving you that information. I can tell you that I have run x86 programs under the Prism emulator, and just like I said with the Samsung Galaxy Book for Edge, which is their Copilot Plus Snapdragon offering, I, I see about a 25% hit in performance. And that's still not all that bad. You know what I'm saying? It depends on the program you're using. Obviously, if you're using Adobe Premiere Pro, and yes, I was able to download directly from Adobe's website to install it, even if the Creative Cloud desktop app didn't want to let me do that. Um, it's still very usable. I could scrub through 4K timelines and do some edits. Anything that's very GPU intensive, like it would be nice to have a dedicated GPU or something like that, obviously isn't going to be as fast. It was export times in Premiere Pro that were slow. But I think probably not a lot of people are going to buy a Surface Pro for Premiere Pro serious editing, right? But Photoshop and Lightroom, yes, and those are ARM native and responsive, work just fine, a pleasure to use. Uh, you can see scrolling right now, there's a website that shows you what programs are currently native on ARM, so you get the best possible performance and battery life and all that sort of thing. And, you know, it could be a lot longer list, but I think it's always been a chicken and egg problem, right? Um, Software makers were like, well, when we see a lot of these on the market and people are buying them, then we'll make software for them. And people are like, well, we're not going to buy the devices unless there's a software there. Now we've reached a crossroads where with emulation, performance is acceptable enough for a business kind of level applications and everyday sort of applications. And the performance is so good that I think we're going to see a lot more. Adobe says the rest of their suite is coming, for example, for ARM, finally. So we're getting a little bit of that 
M1 through M3, even M4 on iPad goodness that we saw from Apple. Now, Microsoft's only just hit that stride now. So Apple's got a couple of years on them. So obviously there's a lot more native applications on Apple right now. And their emulator Rosetta is still top dog, really excellent, really almost no drop in performance there at times. So I'm not saying this is always gonna be the Mac or something like that, but achieving parity is an accomplishment. Now, it still starts at $9.99, and there's two different versions of it. Uh, only Snapdragon X Plus and Elite, though, no Intel offerings for this generation, which is the 11th generation. Uh, but the, the base model is an IPS display, which Microsoft claims is HDR. Same resolution, same 120 hertz variable refresh, right? That sort of thing. And that one starts at $9.99. And 16 gigs of RAM is your base. You can go up to 32 gigs with these, and that's it. And then if for $1,500, you can move up to the Snapdragon X Elite, the faster processor, which also nets you an OLED display made by Samsung, which, I mean, it's eye candy. It's really nice. That's the one that we have. Now, some people have said that they can see the digitizer grid, which is this grid underneath the display that's used by the pen. So your pen can track where it is. Uh, you know, I literally went out, yes, these are new glasses from last week, got new glasses, got them a hyper prescription that actually overcorrects so I can see things up close. And I don't see anything abnormal in the digitizer grid on this for those of you who are worrying about that. So either some of you have amazing eyes or there's a variation in the displays or I, I don't know what it is, but you know, there's always some digitizer grid with any device that has a pen. One thing I will say is by default, HDR was turned on. Usually we don't see this with Windows laptops that do support HDR, even if they have OLED or mini LED or anything. And uh, you know, Windows HDR sometimes can be very good and you can calibrate it and play with the settings on that to improve it. And you would need to here because honestly, it drops the color gamut other than sRGB to use it. And it doesn't appreciably increase the brightness. So I would stick with going non HDR and there's two color profiles, sRGB and and vivid use the vivid one it looks colorful inky blacks all that sort of thing the hdr profile will increase the contrast a bit but it, I, I wouldn't honestly use it unless you you have the time to tweak it so gorgeous looking display as well what about battery life right battery life standby times things like that yeah you know, uh, windows laptops notoriously are not very good at standby which means you're just putting it to sleep and you're putting it in your bag and you're praying it doesn't wake up in your bag and fry itself and that it doesn't drain the battery and all those things that typically are happening currently on x86 architecture not to everybody all the time but frequently enough that people do complain about it and often won't put their device to sleep for long periods of time well this mobile os heritage arm processor here just goes to sleep and wakes up instantly. It does not wake up in the bag and fry itself. It does not drain the battery. Like I can put it to sleep afternoon today. And when I wake it up tomorrow, it will have maybe lost 2% of charge. That's all. So how about run times on a charge? Well, with the display set to 200 nits, mixed productivity, a little photo editing, that sort of thing, a zoom call, um, I'm getting about eight hours, which is about two hours to three hours better than an Intel x86 Surface. Microsoft claims up to 10 hours and 14 hours for local video playback as well. And, you know, by setting the power profiles more aggressively and all those things, I just leave it on the default balance. Then I don't do any of that. That's what I'm getting. I, I could see achieving 10 hours on this at 200 nits of brightness again. Now the OLED model has about five watt hour more battery capacity than the IPS, but the runtime quotes are the same and I wouldn't expect them to be different because OLED typically consumes a bit more power. So how about heat and noise then? Aha, uh -huh. again, Snapdragon is the answer for that like all ARM processors typically are because they are more power efficient, they don't generate as much heat. Uh, where Surface Pros could get really darn hot on the back and you would hear the fans quite a bit. Yes, this does have fans. Uh, this one, I very rarely hear the fans, even when doing like Premiere Pro on it, that sort of stuff. And it gets warm on the back. I ain't gonna say that it doesn't get warm on the back. This is still a very compact 13 inch form factor tablet, right? Uh, but it doesn't get burning hot, not at all. Mm, so yeah, so that's why I'm saying this is just perfectly made for Surface Pro, something that is a hybrid device. It's meant to also be used as a tablet where long battery life or longer battery life, less heat, less noise, all of those things are very important. Great standby times. You want to use it like you would use an iPad. Just put it to sleep and put it in your bag and take it someplace and be all good with it. So yeah, I know some of you are a little hard like on the Snapdragon 
Copilot Plus PCs reviewed like the Samsung Galaxy Book 4 Edge saying, oh, I would only pay $800 for that. As if this was eBay, right? No, it's not. Um, because people have perceptions about what they think a laptop should be. But regardless of that, I personally think Snapdragons are great for laptops too, or will be as we have more ARM native programs. It is exactly what Surface Pro was always meant to be. Other amenities include Wi-Fi 7 and Bluetooth 5.4. 5G is coming, but not until the fall of 2024, so you have to wait a little while for that. You got stereo speakers with Dolby Atmos, 2 watt each, and surprisingly loud and full. Very nice. You have an upgradable SSD with that little magnetic door underneath the flap in the back, the stand, right? So that's nice, and that's thing the Galaxy Book 4 Edge doesn't have for some reason. They went with soldered on storage. Hmm. Better to be able to upgrade it. Uh, according to Microsoft and iFixit, this is a bit easier to service. It still has an adhesive that holds the display on which you must free if you want to get to the internals. Not everybody's idea of a good time, but well, a little bit easier to get inside and service the stuff. Surface Laptop 7 with Snapdragon inside got a lot easier to service. Good. That's nice. So let's talk about that new keyboard, Surface Pro Flex Keyboard, which is ironically named because it should be, it's less flexy compared to the existing Surface Pro covers that we've had on the market. Um, but they call it Flex because it's more flexible in the way you use it because finally it has Bluetooth. So when it's connected via the magnetic and pogo connector on the bottom, it uses that. But when you disconnect it and you can roll the little front edge over now to raise it just slightly, you can use it via Bluetooth, which Yes, you can always buy an external Bluetooth keyboard, but I find that really useful if I'm using it for art, which you folks, if you watch my channel, you know that I do digital art. So you need keyboard commands and stuff like that for Photoshop, but you don't want it flapping off the bottom while you're using it like a tablet, right? So that makes it easier. It also holds the Surface Slim Pen 2, which is the same pen from last generation, so no change in the pen there, and it will charge it as well. The only problem is the price. It's $350 by itself and $450 if you get it with the Surface Slim Pen 2. This is just getting absurd, right? I mean, Apple's keyboards are expensive too, but honest to God, they cover the front, they cover the back. They're built like tanks. They weigh more too, which is nice for durability, but not nice when you have to carry it around, but yeah. For those of you who are thinking about this versus the M4 13-inch iPad Pro, well, that would be the subject of a whole nother video, but a lot of you already know what the story is there, Mo iPads are different. They don't run desktop applications for those of you who use websites that are not still not compatible with mobile OS, iPad OS, Safari, and things like that, or you just need Windows applications. You absolutely must have Photoshop or whatever that program is. That would be the big difference. Now the iPad Pro 13 inch does weigh less, 1.3 pounds versus 1.97 pounds, call it two pounds for the Surface when they're naked. When you put their respective, either the Magic Keyboard for iPad Pro on or this Flex Keyboard for the Surface, then they're about the same weight because the iPad Pro keyboard is significantly heavier. So there you go. Uh, personally, I do prefer the pen on the iPad. I, and Procreate is a lovely app to use, but it's not Photoshop for those of you who just still need Photoshop. And I, not that you can't do serious art on a Surface Pro. I know there are folks who do that, but I think a lot more professionals gravitate still towards the iPad Pro because that Apple Pencil experience is really good. The pencil pen experience on this hasn't changed much from last generation. That's why I'm not going in depth. You do get haptics with the pen. You have good pressure sensitivity and all that sort of thing. It's not bad, but the lines are not really smooth. And some people are like, well, why do you need smooth lines? Because you just do, because sometimes you are drawing slowly and carefully. And if there's any curve involved, you know, or any straight line, you want it to look smooth and natural. That's why you can use software. I mean, you've got flow adjustments and things like that. And, and you can use in Photoshop and in other programs to get around it. But there you have it. Mobile S, OS dilemma with the iPad, but better pen experience and, well, obviously full Windows compatibility with the service and okay pen, but not as amazing for artists. If you're just taking notes, don't worry about it. So that's the Microsoft Surface Pro 11, the Elite version is what we have here with the Snapdragon Elite and the OLED display. And you can tell that I like it a lot. I mean, this is the best. This is what this thing should have been all along in terms of performance, heat, noise, all that sort of thing, and responsiveness, fast, yay, good times. The only drawback, again, if you know you need x86 applications that are real heavyweight, they are not going to run as fast as you would like on this, and that's something to consider, and you might have to wait a while 
until they are compatible. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.